So let me ask a question, because I actually I noticed in the early service that I kept saying three wise men. Did y'all hear a number in that text we just read? How many wise men there were? No? And actually, the word um, that is used is magi, um, which doesn't particularly refer to um, persons of wisdom, but rather astrologer types who use their star charts to try to read what is going on in the heavens. And if there's anything really cool going on in the heavens, then it must portend something that is going to happen on earth that is of significance. And who said they were all men anyway? <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. And they came from far away because they observed a star that didn't behave right. I mean, stars don't usually go ahead of us on the road, right? They don't go ahead of us on the road. Um, they don't uh, stop over a certain location that they want us to check out. So there is this wild star that these magi want to follow because they can't find on their charts or in their uh, ancient writings any reference to what this is about. This wild star really upsets their apple cart. I would even go so far as to say is it pulls them out of their comfort zone. It pulls them away from home and sends them on this long journey. On the fourth Sunday of Advent, we lit the light of the Magi. And we noted that the Magi were on their way. And today, they arrive. And they arrive first in Jerusalem, the seat of power, at least in ancient Judea. And so they, are, they have done enough research that they know that this wild star, um, that it's talking about a new ruler that's been born. And this is where I would say that they weren't particularly wise. They went to Herod to ask about the new king. Now, there is a curious phrase that I have always wondered about. It says, when they ask Herod about this new king that's been born, that Herod is frightened. And the Greek word is deeply troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. And I thought, why would all of Jerusalem have been afraid along with him? Because Herod was not particularly loved. He was a puppet king set up by the Roman Empire, and he collaborated with Rome. He was known for enormous building projects in which he used slave labor and in which the people were taxed to finance. He also in other historical records, ordered that on his death that 70 notable people around Jerusalem be executed when he died so that there would be weeping at his death. Because otherwise, there would have been partying in the streets. And we get another indication of Herod's character just a little farther down in chapter 2 with his violent action at trying to get rid of this newborn king. But being kind of conniving, and in the Gospels, uh, Jesus refers to him as a fox. He tells the Magi, he says, yeah, go, go, and then when you find this newborn king, let me know so I can go pay him homage. Yeah, right. And so when the Magi leave Jerusalem, lo and behold, there is that wild star again. And it leads them down the road about five miles. 
to this little village of Bethlehem, and it stops over the place where the Christ child is. This wild star that has pull them away from their homes and out of their comfort zones, who behaves unlike any other star that they've ever studied, leads them to the Christ child. Hmm. Wild stars. Wild stars that pull us out of our comfort zones, that pull us away from home, that pull us away from the familiar have you ever experienced a wild star? I think Copernicus must have experienced one because he declared that, no, the universe did not revolve around the earth. He got deemed a heretic for that because it busted everybody out of their familiar homey box. Galileo, similar situation. What are wild stars in our current context? Climate change? What is the word of God in dealing with such a challenge as climate change? It requires discernment. The wild star that is the challenge in our current denomination what is the word of God for us in discerning, in discerning who we are in the midst of this? Hopefully many of you received an email Friday uh, containing a press release from the Council of Bishops and also links to an article in UM News um, about an eight-page protocol, an agreement that has been reached on um, separation in our denomination. Uh, Sixteen people met with a mediator um, over a period of months to hammer out an agreement of separation in which um, the parties were all agreeable to the conditions of that protocol. Uh, the traditionalists um, who have formed the Wesleyan Covenant Association as well as the Good News Movement and Confessing Movement, those who are from the conservative side of the denomination, uh, will be exiting the denomination. Um, and our bishop also sent out uh, a letter um, about this, and I want to share that with you because I think it is important um, to inform ourselves, number one, but number two, to hear his words so Bishop Mike McKee says, following last February's special session of the General Conference, most annual conferences in the United States, including the North Texas Conference, and in other parts of the world have experienced significant discord about the outcome. Many persons, regardless of their position on matters relating to human sexuality, know that the decision of the General Conference created harm for traditionalist centrists and progressives. A group of 16 United Methodists from around the world and across the theological spectrum has unanimously agreed in principle on a proposed separation agreement that could provide a path forward for delegates to consider at the General Conference of the United Methodist Church this coming May. Representatives from a number of organizations, including UMC Next, Mainstream UMC, Uniting Methodists, Good News, the Wesleyan Covenant Association, and the Reconciling Ministries Network, along with bishops from Africa, Europe, the Philippines, and the United States, developed an eight-page protocol of reconciliation and grace through separation that allows, quote, each part of the church to remain true to its theological understanding while recognizing the dignity, equality, integrity, and respect of every person, end quote. Highlights from the plan agreed on December 17, 2019 and mediated by attorney Kenneth Feinberg include 
25 million distributed over four years to the formation of a new traditionalist Methodist denomination. This group would relinquish claim to the UMC's assets. Two million for potential additional new Methodist denominations that may emerge from the UMC. 39 million supporting ministries for communities historically marginalized by racism. Churches wishing to stay in the UMC would not be required to conduct a vote. However, conferences and local congregations could vote to separate from the UMC to affiliate with new Methodist denominations. To be clear, nothing will happen immediately and much work remains as legislation currently is being developed for delegates to potentially act on in Minneapolis at the General Conference. This protocol simply provides a framework for potential legislation while offering a great hope for our collective future. More information will be shared as it becomes available. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wrote, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. I hope that you will join me in recognizing this agreement as an opportunity to reshape the general church and as a way to overcome the hostility and division that has long limited us from living into and acting on the mission of the church. It is not clear to me if this wild star that we are experiencing in our denomination is of God or not. Or if it is a wild star of human making, of human frailty and fallibility. But what I am confident in, what I am assured of, is that God is in this somewhere. And that our call as United Methodists in this time and place is still on us. Grace. For some reason, God keeps showering grace on us. And our call is to offer that grace to all through the love of Jesus Christ, who is offered to everyone. No, no exclusions, no buts. God has created every human being as a child of God, and God's claim is on each and every human being. And God has claimed us to spread this word throughout all creation. Our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, that hasn't changed. For us here, our work continues. We're not going away. We're not closing our doors. We're going to plan night in Bethlehem for next December, just like we did last year. Herod is going to go on his tirade and night of Bethlehem, just like he always does. We are going to plan Reindeer Project for next December, just like we did last year. Our children are going to do a musical in May. When you walk through these doors, you're going to see Jimmy Noska's smiling face and get a bulletin in your hand, and Mike and Dolly Self are going to be serving up coffee and welcoming people. That's not going to change. My friends, our call is still on us. Our mission to create and cultivate Christian community here with the blessing of God in which all who either enter these doors or others that we encounter outside these doors will know that God loves them and that they are blessed. That is our call. And it may be a wild star, but God will lead us. Amen.